This is the NBC University Theater, bringing you a full-hour dramatization of Robert Penn Warren's Pulitzer Prize novel, All the King's Men, starring Wayne Morris in the role of Jack Burton. In All the King's Men, Robert Penn Warren has written a novel which many critics feel is one of the finest fictional works of recent years, a book that may well become an American epic, a story of the conflict between the old and the new, and of the men and forces that motivate it. Because of its great power and scope, it is impossible to convey the full story in a single hour. And in presenting this radio play based on the novel, we do so in the sincere hope that it will introduce this outstanding work to many of our listeners and encourage them to an actual reading of the book. Now, All the King's Men by Robert Penn Warren. I'm Jack Burden. Here along the row where the best people had lived, this was my territory. In one of these houses I had grown up. In one had lived my father's friend, Governor Stanton, and his children, my friends Anne and Adam. Adam, who was now a famous surgeon, and Anne, who had been a big-eyed little girl, and after that a big girl, and then my girl, who was now almost an old maid. And then the house where Judge Irwin lived, who had been like a second father to me. He taught me how to shoot ducks and to love history. And now, after all the years, I was back here at midnight with Willie Stark, Governor Stark, who had nothing to do with the Bay Road and Burden's Landing. I was knocking on Judge Montague Irwin's door. Don't mind if we come in, do you, Judge? Jack is always welcome in my house. Well, fine, fine. Come on in, Jack. Uh, happen to have an evening paper, Judge? I haven't had a chance to see one. I have a paper. It publishes my endorsement of the impeachment proceedings against you, if that's what interests you. Just wanted to hear you say it, Judge. <laughs> you, uh, sure you took this to the Lord in prayer? I can only act according to my conscience. Yes. You've been in politics a long time, Judge. So's your conscience. I beg your pardon. You've been a judge a long time, too. How'd you like not being a judge anymore? No man has ever been able to intimidate me. Why, Judge, I ain't even gonna try. <laughs> Jack told me you wouldn't scare. After his long association with your methods, I'm surprised he still remembers there are men who don't scare. Now, look here, Judge Irwin. Take it easy, Jack. <laughs> judge is just a little upset. So, uh, you don't like my methods, huh, Judge? I think I've made that clear. And you want them to impeach me? You'd rather see McMurphy's gang run in the state? I think they are more responsible men. Sure, responsible to you, like my boys are to me. <laughs> see, there's no difference, Judge. Have you finished? No. Not by a long shot. I'm going to do what I have to do in this state, and nobody's going to stop me. The law... Don't tell me about the law. I'm a lawyer, too, and I know what the law is. The law is like three people in bed on a cold night with one blanket. Somebody's got to get pneumonia. Ain't ever been enough law to go around, Judge. Laws don't get roads built or schools or stop the poor people from being cheated on taxes. Those are things I've done. And I'm going to keep on doing them. And surrounding yourself with corruption. That's all you see, ain't it? That scum I got in the legislature. Don't you know they're just something to use? Yeah, sure, you like the things I've done. When I get my little patties black doing them, you start yelling corruption. You and your whole aristocratic gang, you're all alike. Oh, thank you, sir, to get out of this house. Sure, we're getting. And you go ahead and try and impeach me. You can chew on your conscience till you choke on it. And I'll keep on running this state. <laughs> We drove the miles back to the Capitol without talking. I could see the boss was cooking a few things in his mind, and, and like always, I just let him cook. But they got interrupted quick enough when we got back to the governor's mansion. Lucy Stark, the boss's wife, was waiting up. Willie. Huh? Willie, you've got to do something about Tom. Tom? What about Tom? He was in an automobile accident tonight. Accident? My boy, where is he? He's what? all right. He's upstairs asleep. A patrol car brought him home. He was drunk, Willie. Well, if he's all right, then what are you... Willie, he's not all right. He won't be unless you make him Listen, stop. if you're going to start that talk about making Tom quit football again, you can drop it. My son's the greatest quarterback in this country. He'll be all American. You've ruined him, Willie. 
He's arrogant and selfish and spoiled and idle. Oh, Lucy, let him alone. Let him be a man. Let him have fun. Goodness knows I never had any fun, and my son... He thinks the world exists for him. That's what you've taught him. But they've caught up with you, and they'll catch up with him, too, Willie. So, you're against me, too. Oh, Willie, that isn't what I meant. But you... All this dishonesty they're talking about, this impeachment, the things they're saying about you. Oh, Lucy, why can't anybody understand? I do what's got to be done, and I don't care how. But I care, Willie. And I can't stand much more, but I'll tell you that. I'm going up to see if Tom's still resting. Good night. Looks like everybody's trying to run your business for you. No, they don't know a thing about it. They don't know how it is, and you can't tell them. That Judge Owen. Listen, you go to work on him tomorrow. You get something on him. On Judge Irwin? Sure. Well, you got something on him already. You've known him all your life. Sure, I've known him all my life. And I can tell you, you won't find anything on him. No, I won't. You find it. Suppose I don't get it before the impeachment comes up. Oh, forget the impeachment. I can bust it wide open. I just want something on him. Just to know it's there. Now, you find it. And make it stick. <laughs> I had my orders. I had them from Willie Stark. Governor Stark. The boss. And how Willie Stark got to be Governor Stark and the boss, well, that goes back. Back in 1922, they were building a schoolhouse in Mason City. There was a hookup between the Board of County Commissioners and a contract with a brickyard that made lousy bricks. He built the schoolhouse. Two years later, the kids piled out onto the fire escape for a fire drill, and the wall gave way. And the fire escape spilled the kids three floors to the ground. Quite a few got killed. But it was some break for the man who'd fought against that crooked contract, the county treasurer, Willie Stark. He had the county in the palm of his hand, and the city politicians kept that in mind. When they ran Willie for governor, I covered the campaign, if you if you want to call it a campaign. It was awful. Willie was being framed, but he never tumbled. Not until the night before the big barbecue at Upton. That night, I was in my hotel room. It was, oh, it was about 10.30. Come in. Hiya, Willie. Where you been? All over. With Tiny Duffy. Big politician stuff, huh? Shake hands with all the leading citizens? Yeah. Well, what's the matter? Don't they talk nice to you? Sure, sure, they talk all right. Then what's eating you? Jack, a man don't have to be governor. Huh? A man don't have to be governor. I wanted it, Jack. I won't lie to you. I'd have made a good governor. If only they'd have listened. What do you want me to do? Hold your hand? No. No, I don't. I ain't asking for sympathy. Not from you or nobody ever. I... Come in. The door opened, and it was Sadie. Sadie Burke, who'd been sent along by the city boys to keep an eye on Willie and on their own boy, Duffy. Sadie was a baggy tweed suit and a pockmarked face and a mop of black hair like it had been cut off with a meat cleaver. And Sadie'd come up from the mud flats where she was born by knowing what she wanted and playing it to win. Now Sadie stood in the middle of the room and stopped her hand on its way to the bottle. She took a look at Willie and she knew something was wrong. What's up? Nothing. Willie here was just saying how he's not going to be governor. Yeah? So you told him. About time. I never told him. Told me what? Why, that you're not going to be governor. Told me what? You sap. What was it? All right, all right, you sap. You've been framed. Framed? And how? You, you, you wooden-headed decoy, you let him. You thought you were the little white lamb and you let him. Take it easy, Sadie. You thought you were the little white lamb and you know what you are? You're the goat. But why? Why'd they do that to me? Why? Listen, the Harrison boys put you in to split the McMurphy vote in the sticks. Now do you know? Jack, is it true? That's what they tell me. Yeah. Give me a drink. Take it easy, Willie. You're not used to that stuff. He's not used to a lot of things. But he'll get used to it. 
And he'll get used to being a triple-plated, spoon-fed, one-gallon sap. Next afternoon, I poured Willie out to the barbecue. And I propped him up on the platform, and then I got ready to lean back on my spine and pare my fingernails like I always did during one of Willie's speeches. But my fingernails didn't get any attention that day because something had happened to Willie. Folks! Folks, I... I ain't gonna make a speech today. I'm gonna tell you a story. It's about a hick. About a redneck like you all. A hick who thought he could maybe change things. For himself and folks like him. Well, one day the men in the city... They rode up to his pappy's place in a big car and they said how they wanted him to run for governor. And oh, he swallowed it. He was a country boy who believed like any one of you that the plainest, poorest citizen can be governor if his fellow citizens think he's got the stuff for the job. And oh, brother, how they took him in. They said they he wanted him, him to try. He told him the whole thing. And Sadie Burke listened with her eyes narrowing. And Tiny Duffy tried to stop him and couldn't. And I saw something I was going to see a lot of times, and it was always going to get me the same way. I saw Willie Stark in action. Hair down in his forehead, arms swinging, eyes bulging and glittering like something was cutting loose inside of him. Something was that day. They fooled you a thousand times like they fooled me. That's what they think we're for, to be fooled. But, oh, we're going to fool them instead. And what I learned this day, I'm never going to forget. That what a hick wants, he got to do for himself. So when I come back to run for governor again, I'm coming on my own. And I'm coming for blood. The truth is going to be told, and by thunder, I'm going to tell it. Four years later, there wasn't any campaign. There was a massacre. And the guy with the meat axe was Willie Stark. He went to work, and he didn't care what he worked with or who. There was a lot of squawking, but the boss was in the saddle, and he was riding. I was working for him, and and Sadie was working for him. I had a pretty soft job. I can't say about Sadie... She stayed, though, even if she had a lot to put up with. Things like, oh, things like the time when the boss and I made the trip to Chicago. (laughs) That time there was a blonde ice skater with phony Swedish hair. We weren't back two days when Sadie knew about it. First she blew up in the boss's office, and then she came over into mine and blew what she had left over. I'll kill him. I swear it, I'll kill him. You set a high valuation on something. I'll ruin him. I'll drive him out of this state. After all I've done for him. Listen. Don't tell me. I know too much already. Who made him governor? Who put him in a big time? I reckon you mean for me to say that you did. And it's true. And now he goes and two-times me. He wasn't two-timing you. He was two-timing Lucy. Lucy, Lucy. She'd had her way. He'd be still slopping hogs in Mason City right now, and he knows it. He knows what she'd do for him. You seem to think that Lucy's on her way out. Give him time. He'll ditch her. Why, that... Take, that... take it easy, Sadie. Jack. Jack, what was she like? Who? In Chicago. Was she pretty? She was nothing. Forget it. Forget it. Look. Look at my face. Look at it. It was the smallpox. Up there in that shack. My father. He'd come home drunk and start kissing me all over my face. Or else he'd just look at me and start slapping me. And that's the way I'll always be. Sadie. No matter what you do for them, they'll kiss the face. And then they'll kick dirt in it. That's the way it'll always be. Listen, you make out all right. What do you care what he does? What do you know about it? What do you know? Let him go if it's all this grief. Let him go. I'll kill him first. I'll kill him, I swear it. Listen, no matter who he runs after, he'll come back to me. He'll come back. He's got to. He can do without any of them, but he can't do without me. Do you hear? He can't do without Sadie Burke. (laughs) 
After a few years, the old McMurphy gang got to stirring around again, and this impeachment thing came up. Well, the impeachment proceedings were killed before they ever got to the legislature. But the crowd didn't know that. The wool hats and the mother hubbards that swirled around the Capitol that day, not singing, not yelling, just standing there, they didn't know. I did, and I wished I didn't. I wished I could have been hearing it for the first time when he came out and stood looking very small on the big steps in the flood of light, and after a long time, lifted his hand to quiet the roar. I tell you, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to build a hospital, the biggest and finest money can buy, for every man and woman of you, for free, because it is your right. You hear? It is your right. And, and, I, and I shall live in your will and your right. And the man who tries to stop me, by heaven, I'll break it. And I don't care what I hit him with or how. Because your will is my strength. Your need is my justice. So that was licked. But I still had my orders to get something on Judge Irwin. You know, the easiest thing to think about is money. So I thought about money. Was there ever a time when the judge didn't have enough money to make the judge happy? I went first to the only two people living who knew him as well as I did. I fixed it up for us to have dinner together. Ann Stanton and Adam Stanton and I. And after dinner, I shot the question at them. Ann... Was Judge Irwin ever broke? What are you talking about, Jack? Was Judge Irwin ever broke? Think now. You too, Adam. The judge? Why, no, I don't think... Yes, wait a minute. Yes, he was too. When? Let me see. I was just a kid. I heard them talking. It must have been about uh, 1913 or 1914. Uh-huh. Thank you. Jack, why did you want to know? Oh, I don't want to know. My best pal wants to know. The guy who pays me the first of every month. Oh. You mean Stark. Governor Stark, yes. Listen, Jack, what you do for a living is your business, but that man and his... That man, that man, that's what you all call him. He's done something for this state, and that's more than anybody else ever did, including Judge Irwin. And my father. Mm, Your father was a nice guy. He was even a pretty good governor. You'd better say so. There was nobody like him. Maybe. But the rich still got richer and so forth. He ran this state from the top down, and Willie's running it from the bottom up. Why, he's going to build the biggest free hospital and medical center in the country. Sure. That's his bribe. Now I suppose he wants you to find some scandal on Judge Irwin. He thinks everybody is as dirty as he is. Well, let's forget it. What's the difference if he knows Irwin was broke? Twenty years ago, there's no law against it. Well, listen, I've got to be going. Oh, Adam, not yet. It's early. Not for me. I've got three operations in the morning. Anyway, I've had my evening's worth of politics. So long, you two. Don't get up. I'll let myself out. Jack, why do you have to spoil everything? You didn't used to be this way. That man has done this to you. Anne, if I was so wonderful before, why didn't you marry me? Leave that out of it. That man... There you go again. That man. Just because he came off a dirt farm instead of a plantation. You're a bunch of snobs. All right. I'm snobbish. I'm so snobbish, I had lunch with him last week. You what? I had lunch with him. A cheese sandwich in the cafeteria in the basement of the Capitol. My, my. Governor Stanton's daughter having lunch with Governor Stark. What will the society editors say? I went to see him about getting state money for the children's hospital. And I'm going to get it, too. Does Adam know? What's the difference? It's just business. Well, business or not, if you don't know his reputation with women, it's time you did. You're not supposed to be running around Running around, running around, don't be a fool. I'm nearly 35, and I can take care of myself. 35, Jack. Practically senile. And I haven't done anything. Why didn't I do something? I could have been a doctor, or a nurse, or Adam's assistant. Or gotten married? To me? Oh, I don't mean just getting married. I mean... You don't know what you mean, Anne. Except that little Jackie has spoiled your pretty evening. Let's leave it like that. Anyway, I'd found out something I wanted to know. Judge Irwin had once been broke. You know, you go looking for the secret passage in the old house. 
You tap along the wall inch by inch, and you listen for the hollow sound. Here you are, young man. The record on the Irwin plantation. Thanks. What's a young fellow like you want to poke around the records in a county courthouse for? I'm just learning to read English. I want to practice. Huh. 1907, mortgage. Montague Irwin, $42,000. Foreclosure proceedings begun March 1914. May 1914, mortgage paid in full. Hmm. He paid that mortgage. He paid it while he was running a cotton plantation. You don't clear that kind of money in one season on a cotton plantation. He was also attorney general under Governor Stanton. You don't get rich there either. At least... You're not supposed to. Times Chronicle, February 26, 1914. Montague Irwin, Attorney General, today dropped the suit against the Southern Bell Fuel Company for recovery of $150,000 in back royalties on the state coal lands. In the opinion of the Attorney General, the terms of the contract are ambiguous and the state has no case. Madison Corporation, New York City, is holding company for Southern Bell Fuel Company... Also, American Electric Power Company. You get to that point, and then you pray. There isn't anything else to do, so you pray. You fall asleep. And right before you go to sleep, you pray it'll come to you in a dream. And it did. Just a name. A funny name, Mortimer Littlepaw. In a fifth-page headline on some old cheese-smelling newspaper someplace back in my life, the headline read... Coroner's jury decides Mortimer Little Paw death accident. And under that, general counsel for the American Electric Power Company. Yes? Miss Little Paw? Yes. You wish to commune with some departed spirit? That's right. Come in. Sit there while I put out the candles. The spirits will not come where there is light. Oh, that's understandable. Are you ready now? I reckon. First, I must make contact with the spirit world. The spirits are ready. With whom do you wish to commune? Um, ask for Mortimer. Mortimer? Mortimer Littlepaw. Your brother Mortimer. I want to ask him about the suicide. Suicide? You... You've tricked me. I just want to know about Mortimer. My my brother's death was an accident. That's what the newspaper story said. Get out! Get out! You, I... I thought you were all right. I may not be all right, but my money is. Look. Look at this. One hundred bucks. Tell me about the letter from Mortimer that the bellboy swore he mailed to you and you swore you never got. No. No, it's a lie. What's the matter with you? Don't you need money? Here. Two hundred more. Pick it up and start talking. No, I know you. You're from the insurance company. Look, look. The insurance company's forgotten all about it. Nobody cares. He was driven to kill himself, wasn't he? He'd given years to that company, and when they threw him out to make room for another man, isn't that so? He did. That man. He drove my brother to his death. They hired him. It was a bribe. And my brother knew it, but they said he couldn't prove it. And they threw him out. So he killed himself. He was old and sick. He'd worked all those years. He didn't know that they would throw him out. And when they did, he he went to the governor and... What? What did you say? To the governor. To Governor Stanton. And they told him Listen, that... listen. Are you telling me that Governor Stanton... He wouldn't listen. It's all in the letter Mortimer wrote me. It's all there. Where's the letter? I... I have it. Look. Four hundred dollars. Give me the letter. No. You want to get rid of it. You're that man's friend. Huh. He wouldn't think so. Give it to me. I'll... When I went to the governor, I... You went to the governor, too? After my brother was dead, I went. I asked him to punish that man. But he said that man was his friend. But I had no proof. Good Lord. Did you show him the letter? Yes. And he just stood there and said he'd have me punished for perjury because I'd sworn I never got it. Miss Littlepaw, give me the letter. No, I... I'm afraid. Don't be afraid. Get it. Nobody will bother you now. I swear it. She got it. And it was all there. For nothing is ever lost. There's always something, the boss had said. The twitch in the old wound. The slimy bottom in the clear pool. The oily track across the clean snow. There's always the truth. And we history students, 
We love the truth. From Hollywood, the NBC University Theater is bringing you Wayne Morris in a radio play based on Robert Penn Warren's novel, All the King's Men. Another in our series of dramatizations of outstanding works by modern American and British authors. If you are interested in supplementing your enjoyment of these productions with home study under college supervision, be sure to listen to the announcement to be made at the close of our program. Our intermission speaker today is Mr. Granville Hicks, author of The Great Tradition, Small Town, John Reed, The Make of Other Books. We present Mr. Hicks speaking to you from Schenectady. Robert Penn Warren, who was born in Kentucky 43 years ago, is a teacher, a critic, a poet, and a novelist. He has taught at Southwestern University and the University of Louisiana, and is now at the University of Minnesota. And he is a shining exception to George Bernard Shaw's rule that those who can do and those who can't teach. For his reputation as a teacher of writing, high as it is in the profession, is surpassed by his reputation as a writer. All the King's Men, which was given the Pulitzer Prize as the best novel of 1946, was Warren's third novel, although it was the first of his books to reach a large public. His first novel, Night Rider, published in 1938, has recently been reissued, and it is worth reading. So, for that matter, is his second novel, At Heaven's Gate. All three of these books resemble, in certain ways, the sociological novels of such writers as John Passos and John Steinbeck. That is... Each of them is directly concerned with problems that grow out of the organization of society. But Warren's emphasis is different from the emphasis of the left-wing novelists of the 30s. They said, in effect, here is an evil situation. How can we remedy it? He asks, what does this situation mean? What moral values apply to it? All the King's Men is a dramatic story of political intrigue in a southern state with a central character... Willie Stark, who was obviously suggested by the late Huey Long. The style is racy, colloquial, and very skillful. Very often, Warren's prose rises to a rich and original imagery, and the reader remembers that this man is a poet. In the novel, as in the dramatization we are listening to, Jack Burden tells the story. And it is his story as much as it is Willie Stark's, and perhaps more. Willie Stark acts... And his actions are both good and bad. He acts and does not reflect. Jack Burden reflects, trying to understand the significance of Willie's life and his own. He begins by believing that life has no meaning. But in the end, he perceives that even if history is blind, man is not. The meaning of life is not discovered. It is created by the effort of man's imagination, intelligence, and will. From the beginning of his career, Robert Penn Warren has known that the philosophical problem, the moral problem, and the social problem cannot be understood separately, and he has had the courage to tackle them all together. That courage, combined with his insight and craftsmanship, have made him one of the most important of contemporary novelists. Our dramatization of All the King's Men starring Wayne Morris continues from Hollywood after a brief pause for station identification. Seven months I was digging on Irwin, the boss was plenty busy. It was that hospital he had dreamed up. He had it on his mind. Tiny Duffy had it on his mind, too. Tiny Duffy, the fat politico in the striped pants from the days of that first campaign. Tiny was lieutenant governor now, because the boss just liked to keep him around to look at him and, and to make him sweat. Yes, Tiny had his mind on the hospital, all right. There was six million dollars going into it, and Tiny was just one big overgrown itch. 
So one day, I walked into the boss's office, and Tiny was standing on the hearth rug, and the tallow was melting off him fast. Look at him, Jack. Look at him. Tiny, you can't miss him. Look at him. Tried to trick me. You got that contractor in here, that gummy Larson. Boss, I, I thought... You thought you'd trick me into giving Larson the hospital contract so you could get your... Now, cut. boss... Go on, get out. Get out! I'm going, boss. I'm going. Oh, can't he understand? I don't want him messing with this thing. What'd you expect? There's six million dollars in it. Yeah, but not for him. He's just being logical, according to his lights. Listen, Jack, I'm building the best hospital in the country. The Willie Stark Hospital. And Tiny's not going to mess with it. Yes, sir. The biggest and the best, and anybody can go there without a dime. And... and vote for you. I don't care if they vote for me or not. And get that grin off your face. Listen, I'll still grin when I feel like it. Oh, Jack, can't you understand? It's going to be all the best. Oh, yeah, and the guy that'll run it, he's going to be the best, too. They told me up in New York who to get. Who? And you're going to get him for me. Dr. Adam Stanton. What? Boss, are you seeing pink elephants? You get him. Look, boss, Adam hates your guts. I'm not asking him to love me. I'm asking him to run my hospital. And I'm telling you to get him. Listen, Adam, I want to tell you something, and don't start yelling till I'm through. Okay, Jack? Governor Stark wants you to be the director of the new hospital. No, thanks. Look, look, think it over. You can write your own ticket. The boss said... The boss can't buy me. And he can't threaten me either. He's not trying to. Now, take it easy. It's no disgrace. Maybe not. But the answer is still no. Listen, Ann. We've been walking for two hours... Three more steps and we'll be in the river. All right, Jack. Let's stop here. Okay. Now, what do you want to talk about? Adam. What about Adam? Oh, you know perfectly well. You went there and told him Look, that... I, I just made him a proposition. Jack, you've got to make him take it. He's got to take it. Why? To save himself. There's something driving him. What? Oh, I don't know. I don't know him anymore. I went to talk to him about it and we had such an awful row... I told him he was being selfish, and he said a man owed it to himself not to touch filth, and... Oh, Jack, why is he this way? Why? Why? Oh, because he's the son of Governor Stanton and the grandson of Judge Stanton. He's ready to throw the world away because it doesn't look like his nice, romantic, aristocratic picture of it. That's why. He's got to take it. Are you sure you mean that? Because I can make him. How? I can change his picture of the world. I can give him a history lesson. A history lesson? Mm-hmm. You remember when I asked you about Judge Irwin being broke? Well, he was broke. And he took a bribe. And I can prove it. Judge Irwin? A bribe? But he was father's friend. That's right. My father took a bribe? No, 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 no. Not that bad. Not that bad. Not that bad. Ha! Huh. I don't believe it. Oh, it's true. He knew about the judge and protected him. I've got documents to prove it. I'm sorry, but it's true. Sorry. You're sorry. You. And, and... Don't touch me. You, you dug it all up for that man, Stark. All the lies. And now you say you're sorry. I hate you, Jack Burton. I hate you. Hello? Jack? Ann, I was hoping you'd call. Jack, I... those papers you sent me, those photostats, I showed them to Adam. Oh, Jack, it was awful. I know. No, you don't. You can't. He loved Father so much. Yeah. What about the job? He'll do it, Jack. He told me to tell you that you could arrange everything with Governor Stark. Well, Doc, what do you think of it? What? My hospital. I think it will do the state some good, Governor, and get you some votes. Hmm. Forget the votes, boy. There are lots of ways to get votes. So I understand. It'll do good, but not unless you take it over. I won't stand any interference. <laughs> Don't that, Doc. I might fire you, but I won't interfere. Well, I told you I'd take the job. That's all we have to talk about. Sure, Doc, sure. 
<laughs> and don't you worry. I'll keep your little hands clean. Don't you worry about a thing. I can take care of myself. Sure you can, Doc. And it's all your baby. What you say goes. <laughs> oh, you're a great guy, Doc. A great guy. And don't you let anybody tell you different. And so it was settled. But not for me. I'm a student of history, and I had a question. Anne had gone to talk to Adam about the hospital. Who had told Anne about the offer? The question simmered in my mind for weeks without any answer. But I found out... I found out on a day I heard Sadie making a racket in the boss's office. I'd heard her make plenty of those rackets they'd gotten to be mechanical. They didn't mean anything to her anymore. But this was different. I knew it as soon as she got through with them and came slamming into my office. I knew this was different. This was like the good old days. I'll kill him. I tell you, this time I'll kill him. Take it easy, Sadie. He's done it again. He's two-timing me. Now, Sadie, we've gone into all this before. It's Lucy he's two-timing, not you. Oh, he's... shut up. You and your high-toned friends. My what? Your high-toned friends. You ought to come mixing them in. What are you talking about? I'll show her. I may not be so high-toned, but I made him governor. I'll show her. Sadie, what in the... You know what I'm talking about. Why don't you go in there and knock him down? I thought she was yours. Who? Well, may maybe he's fixed you up, too. Like that doctor. Yeah. What's he making you director of? Sadie, Sadie, you don't know what you're saying. Sadie, you're not saying that she, that she... she... Yeah, she. She, that's just what I'm saying. Ann Stanton. <laughs> So I knew who'd told Ann about the hospital. I had come away from Burden's Landing and gone over to Willie Stark. And now, somehow, by an obscure and necessary logic, I had handed Ann Stanton over to Willie Stark, too. Ann, who'd been all my days and all my dreams when I was 21. Ann, who had loved me. Ann Stanton, who belonged to Willie Stark. <laughs> Well, the summer went on and we lived in it. And nothing changed. And then on my way to the boss's office one day, I got slammed out of the way by 180 pounds of sure bet for all American, which was on its way out. Kind of looked like Tom Stark had been on the carpet, and the carpet belonged to Willie Stark. Jack, I ought to break that kid's neck. Well, this is a new one. What's up? What's up? A rat named Fry come to see me. Said Tom's got to marry his daughter. Get that. Hmm. No routine, huh? Who's behind Fry? Who do you think? McMurphy had a guy over here right on Fry's heels. McMurphy can make Fry see reason, I suppose. That's right. What's he want? <laughs> the Senate. And so do you. And I'll get it. Judge Irwin can stop McMurphy. Remember I told you to get something on him? Where is it? I got it. Huh? Listen, boss. I'm going to give Judge Irwin a break. If he can prove it isn't true, I won't spill it. Listen, who are you working for? I'm giving him a break. Okay, Jack. Do it your way. But if it'll stick, you know what I want, and it better stick. Well, Judge, you through reading? You've done quite a research job here, Jack. Must have taken you quite a while. Yes, it did. It is difficult for me to believe. Me too, Judge. Thanks for that much, Jack. The stock no? No, no, I... Told him I wouldn't tell him until I'd seen you. You have tender sensibilities for a blackmailer. You're trying to protect the blackmailer. No, Jack, no. I, I'm not trying to protect McMurphy. I'm Maybe I'm trying to protect myself. Now, you know how to do it, then. Just tell McMurphy to lay off a Tom Stark. Uh, no, Jack. No. I'll be back tomorrow, Judge. Look, you think it over and make up your mind. I know my own mind, boy. It's made up. I'll be back tomorrow, Judge. Sure, Jack, sure. You come back tomorrow. But my mind is made up. His mind was made up, all right. 
That afternoon, Montague Irwin, who'd once taught me to shoot ducks, shot himself through the heart. There was only one thing left for the boss to do about McMurphy, and that was to buy Gummy Larson. He did it. Gummy got the hospital contract, but the boss took it hard. You tell him. You tell him he leaves one window latch off, he leaves one sack of cement out of that concrete. If he puts in one extra teaspoonful of sand, I'll rip him open. I'll rip them all open. That hospital, they're putting their dirty hands on it. And it's mine. Tom Stark did that. And then Tom Stark did something else. Tom Stark went out on the football field one Saturday. The 180 pounds of beautiful mechanism, the quarterback to dream about, the darling of the grandstands, went down in the scrimmage and didn't get up. The boss sent me to bring Lucy to the hospital. Willie. Willie, how is he? Now, look here, Lucy. He's all right. He, he's going to be all right. How is he, Willie? I told you, he's all right. You say it, but what does the doctor say? Well, I'm waiting for Stanton now, but Tom's all right. Do you understand? Can I see him? Yeah. Jack? Yeah. Show her the way, Will. Oh, wait. Governor Stark. Well, Doc? There's a fracture and dislocation of the fifth and sixth cervical vertebra. What's that mean? He has a broken neck. Go on. We can do either of two things. Put him in a cast, operate. Go on. The operation is the outside chance. It may be fatal. We may also find that the spinal cord has been crushed. In that case, the patient will remain paralyzed for the rest of his life. <laughs> Go on. I advise the operation, but I want you to know it's radical. It's the gambler's choice. Well, do it. Mrs. Stark? Yes. Very well. I shall operate immediately. Do it. Oh, my boy. Sit down, Marie. Sit down and rest. Don't you worry, Lucy. He's going to be all right. God grant it. He will. He's got to. Lucy? Yes, Will. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to name the new hospital for him. For my Tom. The Tom Stark Hospital. It'll be named for him. Oh, It'll Willie, be a... Willie, Willie, don't you see? Huh? These things don't matter. None of them. Willie, he was my baby boy. He was our baby boy, Willie, and these things don't ever matter. Don't you see? Three hours, Lucy. Three hours. What are they doing? Jack, why don't you go see what they're doing? Look, boss, why don't you try to lie down? You've been up all night. Lie down. Jack, don't you understand that boy in there? That, that's my boy. <laughs> well, Governor Stark, he will live. Oh, thank God. The spinal cord was crushed. No. I'm sorry, Governor. Tom. Tom. Willie. Come, Willie. It's time to go. Sit down, Jack. I want you to be in on this. Tiny. Yeah, boss? There won't be any contract with Gummy Larson. Boss. Boss, you can't, boss. Yes, I can. You tell Larson. Go on, tell him. Tell him now. Go on, get out. Boss. Get out. Shut the door, Jack. Sure. Well... Boss, it doesn't matter if you kick Tiny around some more. He's built for it. But Larson's a different cookie. Listen, Jack. Don't you understand, boy? You gotta start someplace. I didn't know what he was talking about. And he got up and he went to Sadie's office, and I could hear them having words, but I couldn't catch any of them. 
So I went about my business, and it was late afternoon before I got back to my office and got the message to come to Ann Stanton's apartment right away. Jack! Jack, you've got to find him. You've got to, Jack. Find who? Tell him how it was. Tell him it wasn't what they said. Tell him it wasn't because of who me. Said what? Find him, Jack. Find him. You've got to. You. Come out of it now. Stop jabbering. Now tell me. Adam. He said it was all because of me. What was? That he was made director of the hospital because of me. Because of me and Stock. Jack, you've got to find him. Find him and tell Stop him. Stop it. Stop it or I'll shake your teeth out. Now, start at the beginning. Tell he came, me. He came up here. He started calling me names. It was awful. What did he tell you? Some man had called him and told him about... Mm. About... About you and Governor Stark. The man told him that was the reason he was made director. And Adam, he believed it. He believed it all. He said terrible things, Jack. You've got to find him and tell him. Tell him what? Tell him it wasn't like that, Jack. I loved Willie. I loved him. And he's gone. Stark's gone? I went to the place, the place where we always met. He called me to come there. And he told me. He's going back to his wife. Oh, I'll be done. Huh? He said you had to start someplace. What? Hmm? Oh, nothing. I'll find Adam. Get him. Get him, Jack. He's all I've got now. I went looking for Adam, but I didn't find him. Around nine at night, I got a message from the boss to come over to the Capitol. We walked together across the big domed lobby, crowded with men, because the legislature was in session. And then there were two shots. The one from Adams 22 that got the boss, and the one from the state patrolman's 38 that got Adam. They buried the boss in a crowd that it took the police two hours to clear away afterward. And they buried Adam with just me and Ann and a few snoopers who came around. Then for weeks I stayed at the landing to be near Ann. Then I couldn't stay there anymore. I was the history student. And there was something I wanted to know. Hope you don't mind my coming to see you, Sadie. Why should I mind? How are you getting on? All right. Why shouldn't I be? What do you want? Oh, I came to ask you a question. Sadie, Adam Stanton killed the boss, but he didn't get that idea himself. Somebody primed him. Sadie, somebody called Adam up that afternoon and gave him the whole works. Do you have any idea who it was? I don't need any idea. I know. Who? Duffy. How do you know? You... Why do you always have to mess in things? How do you know? Why can't you leave me alone? How do you know? Because I told him to. You killed Stop him. Stop looking at me like that. All right, I killed him. He was throwing me over for that Lucy, and after what I did for him... You killed Adam Stanton. Adam Stanton? I killed Willie. I killed him. Yes. Well, I guess I found out what I came for. We'll fix Duffy. It won't stick in a court. There's other ways. It'll drag her into it, you know. That Ann Stanton. She'll do it. I want to get Duffy. Suits me. The world's full of Duffies. I've been knowing them all my life. I'm just thinking about one. Jack. Yeah. Let it drop. What? Let it drop, Jack. I don't get it. That Stanton girl, Jack. She's had enough to put up with, I guess. That doesn't sound like you, Sadie. Don't it? Listen, I'm not saying she's my best friend. But it'll be awful rough on her, Jack. Give her a break. Let it drop. Okay, Sadie. I'll let it drop. It was nice of you to come out, Jack. It's been a long time, Lucy. Thought I'd see how you was getting along. I've been well, Jack. And you? Oh, fine, fine. I'm getting married to Ann Stanton. Oh. I'm glad. I, I hope you'll be happy. Thanks. You knew Tom was dead. Yes, yes, I, I knew that. Pneumonia. He died very quickly. <sighs> I'm resigned now, Jack. 
And God has given me something so I can live. Would you like to see him? Him? Who? I'll show you. Come on, this way. What the... It's Tom's baby. It's my grandchild. You remember, Jack, that poor girl. Yeah, boy, do I. I went to see her, and I persuaded her to let me adopt him. A legal adoption? Oh, yes. I gave her what I could. It wasn't much. Willie always spent everything he made. But I gave her $6,000. Well, that was nice for her. Yeah. Don't you want to hold him? Yeah, sure. What's his name? Well, at first, I thought I'd name him for Tom. And then it came to me. I'd name him for Willie. His name is Willie Stark. Willie Stark. You know, Jack, I named him for Willie because... Well, because Willie was a great man. He made mistakes, Jack. Maybe he did do bad things like they say. But inside... Inside, he was a great man. A great man. You see, Jack... I... I just have to believe that. The Curtain Falls on our dramatization of Robert Penn Warren's All the King's Men. The 16th in our current series of radio plays based on outstanding works in modern Anglo-American fiction. You may learn more about these authors and their works by enrolling in the college-supervised courses being offered in connection with the NBC University of the Air. This week, we're happy to announce that the University of Tulsa at Tulsa, Oklahoma, has completed its plans for offering such a course thus joining the University of Louisville and Washington State College, whose established home study plans are already serving listeners in other areas of the nation. For information, then, on how you may enhance your knowledge through these courses, write to the NBC University of the Air, in care of the University of Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky, Washington State College, Pullman, Washington, or the University of Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma. This dramatization was written by Clarice A. Ross. Your intermission commentator was the distinguished author, Mr. Granville Hicks. Starred in the role of Jack Burton was Wayne Morris, who will soon be seen in the Warner Brothers picture, John Loves Mary. Our cast included Paul Freeze as Willie, Paul McVeigh as the judge, Lois Corbett as Lucy, Sylvia Sims as Sadie, Jacqueline DeWitt as Anne, Louis Van Ruten as Adam, Anne Stone as Lily, and Jim Nusser as Tiny. Your announcer, Don Stanley. Director of the NBC University Theater is Andrew C. Love. Original music for All the King's Men was composed and conducted by Albert Harris. Next week at this time, listen for the NBC University Theater's presentation of The Ministry of Fear by Graham Greene, starring Alan Mowbray. This program came to you from Hollywood. Yes, indeed, it is a wonderful Sunday on NBC. Listen first for the adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. Then it's time for Horace Height with more talented new entertainers, followed immediately by the shenanigans of Phil Harris and Alice Fay. Then for Fred Allen with guest Charles Boyer, topped off with Robert Cummings in Let's Live a Little on NBC Theater and many, many other fine programs. Listen all evening for your wonderful Sunday on most of these NBC stations. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.